Okay, we're back. Uh, I wanted to give a little sort of recap of our discussion of the entity relationship model for this week. So we're going to fire up uh, Microsoft Visio. Going to open up a new uh, drawing for us. Okay, and um, let's start out by um, just making this look a little bit bigger. Okay, I tend to like it to be an actual size. Uh, if you recall, what we were talking about this week with the entity relationship model is that there are times when we won't have sort of sample data and we won't have um, all of the requirements hammered out. We won't know exactly what we need to track when we start the design process. So what we need is a model to let us start to talk about entities, relationships, and attributes in a logical way, meaning we don't know exactly how this is going to end up in the database. We don't know how it's going to change when we get our sample data. But we need to start to think about what we want to track and what about those entities we need to track in order to solve our problem. This is what entity relationship diagrams and the entity relationship model are really good for. So uh, if we go back to our example for um, the week, we were talking about players and teams and positions and these kinds of things. Um, you know, one of the really convenient things about entity relationship diagrams is I can start to put those entities here even if I don't know what the identifiers are. Okay, even if I don't know exactly how these things are related, this gives me a place to start. Okay, so I can just sort of put in my entities, right? I know if I want to track players and teams, I need to track these things. Okay, um, and then we also talked about sort of positions, right, that we may want to track, like, what positions people play. And so I can start by just putting these entities here and um, sort of thinking about how these things are related just in a logical way, right? So once you get to this stage, you probably want to start thinking about, okay, well, how do players relate to teams, right? Well, a player plays for one and only one team, but a team is made up of many players, okay? So this is a pretty standard um, example of a one-to-many relationship, right? A player plays for one and only one team, but a team is made up of many players. So one of the things that we'll want to do is render that relationship between player and team, right? So we grab a relationship, okay? And um, we can start by just uh, putting one end against the entity that we want to connect, okay? And so you'll see the player entity is now highlighted. Uh, that means that it's connected there. And then we'll want to sort of pull the other end to team and connect them. Okay, you'll notice that uh, this is not crow's feet notation. We'll want to change that. We can go to database, display options, the relationship tab, and just select crow's feet. Okay, and then it'll look pretty much the way we'd expect it to look. Now, if you look at the way I've actually got this relationship, um, this doesn't really look like what we had discussed, right? I mean, if I read this diagram, this means that a player can play for zero or many teams, but a team can have one and only one player. Um, that doesn't really sound like what we would want, right? Um, we want to be able to have a team have more than one player. So in other words, I got this relationship backwards. So let's sort of talk about how to fix it, okay? This is something that's that's very frequent when you first start working with these symbols. Um, you know, understanding one and many and so on and so forth can be a little tricky. If you decide that you've gotten your relationship backwards and you need to turn it around, you just grab one edge, okay, you pull it off, you grab the other edge, and you reconnect them as needed. Okay, so that looks more like what we're used to, okay, that a team can have many players, okay, and a player can play for one and only one team. Now, at this point, when we look at the details of this relationship, we may decide that some of the prob some of the aspects of this model aren't quite right. Okay, so we can go to the relationship here, okay, and we can actually check out um, all of the different assumptions here. Okay, so for example, one of the ways to think about this is a player, according to this model, plays for one and only one team and must play for a team. Okay, meaning uh, you can't have any players that are not on a team. Uh, if you decide that that's not something that's realistic, okay, that perhaps there are um, players who are free agents or 
people who you still want to track as a player who aren't necessarily associated with a team, what you may want to do is change the cardinality, okay, so that it's one or more, okay, or pardon me, what we actually want to do is, right, make it so that a player may, there may, may be with four zero or one teams, okay. Um, on the other side, we may decide that if a team should always have at least one player, meaning that there's never a place where you can have a team that has no players, we could actually change the other side, okay, and say that that relationship should be one or more. Um, these are all things that you'll start to experiment with as you start to build your models. Uh, generally, for the types of things that we'll do in class, the default way that it renders these relationships is generally fine. Um, but it's good to know that you can actually change the cardinalities um, of these of these different uh, relationships and get more specific if you feel that you need to. So if you really want to specify that a team must have at least one player, you can do so. Um, if you want to specify that it's possible for a player not to necessarily be associated with a team, you can do so. Okay, and um, so you should feel free to sort of use those. Uh, keeping in mind that for many of the things that we'll actually need, um, the default will work just fine. Um, so in other words, this gives us a way to relate team and player without necessarily knowing what identifiers would have to connect these two, ID, two um, entities. Right? We don't necessarily know yet. So, but I do know that there's a one-to-many relationship from team to player, and I want to render that. Okay, so let's tackle the other side of this. If we talk about positions, right, um, one of the things that uh, came up in class is what happens if a player has more than one position, right? So, in other words, each position can be held by more than one player, and each player can hold more than one position. How do we render a many-to-many -many relationship in with this technique? Okay, um, on the board we were drawing them with basically both sides having these crow's feet. Um, that's not really the way we're going to do it in Visio. Okay, the way that we'll do it in Visio will be we'll actually use an intersection table. Okay, so um, an entity that actually sits between the player and the position. And it will essentially represent the many-to-many -many relationship between positions and players. Okay, so to give you a sense of how that, I know it's pretty abstract, to give you a sense of how that might work, we can move the entity here, okay, and give it some sort of name that demonstrates that it's an intersection. It's an entity that we'll use for intersection. Okay, and so once we get this, now we just have to connect the player to this and the position to this entity in two one-to-many relationships. Okay, so the way that would work is we pull this out here, okay, and connect it like that, and we pull another relationship here, and we connect it like that. And so what we've done is we've created a many-to-many -many relationship between player and position by using this additional entity um, as a way to represent that that relationship and aspects of that relationship. Okay, so this is you know one way to think of this is this is kind of an implied entity, right? Um, when we actually implement our database, we'll need some table that will actually relate players to positions. Okay, in a many-to-many -many fashion. This is the way that we can actually do this. Right? And again, same rules apply, right? You can change certain aspects of the cardinality. You can, you know, you can do that on both sides. You can sort of um, give these more precise names, right? So you can specify exactly what these positions are. You know, so a, a player has a position and so on and so forth. You, you can actually sort of um, work through a lot of the modeling aspects if you want to. Um, but once you get here and you feel comfortable with the way that you've designed these entities and relationships, so, so you, in other words, if you get a good sense of, yeah, that's, that's, those are the entities that I want to track and that's how those entities are related, then you can start to do some other kinds of things, right? So now we can start to fill in some of the details here. All right, um, so if we think about position, right, and w the types of things we want to track in position, you know, we might want 
sort of um, to make up an ID for this for this thing, right? So th this is the kind of um, table that eventually will be um, sort of like a lookup table for us. So we may want to just specify what we know will eventually be a surrogate key, okay? Make that the primary key of that table, okay? And just give us a position here and make this text. Okay, and we'll probably make that required. Notice if it's required, it goes in bold. Okay, and we'll probably want to be more specific about that data type, right? We don't want this length to be 10. Maybe we want this length to be, say, 20 or something. Okay, whatever the largest uh, valid uh, piece of data that can go in there, that's what we would put. And for our purposes, we can sort of call that 20. Uh, and we'll want to do that for each of the entities, right? We'll want to start to enumerate the attributes associated with these entities. So we'll want to say sort of team ID here. And remember, we said that surrogate keys should be integers. Right? Keep in mind, I am looking a little bit ahead, right? Ideally, we would be talking about these things in terms of identifiers. So this isn't a perfectly logical model. Um, but uh, I think it gives us enough of a tool in that we can basically start to use it um, thinking of these right now as identifiers, but knowing that at some point we'll actually have to implement them in the, in the database. Okay, so this lets us um, specify an identifier for team ID. And then of course we can have team name here. And we'd probably want that to be required. And then we said that we'd also want to track location, right? So we want to be able to track both that the team name is the Pirates and that the location is Pittsburgh. Okay, and again, we'd probably want to adjust the additional aspects of the metadata. Okay, so maybe this would be 25 here, right? And maybe this would be 25. Okay, and as we start to get sample data, we may have to adjust this metadata. So for example, if you find a city name or a team name that's actually longer than that, you would go back and you would revise your metadata to make sure that it could accommodate what you needed. And um, we're going to keep on doing this. Now notice, um, because we've already established these relationships, it already knows to put in foreign keys here. Okay, so it's already anticipating what we need in terms of our key structure to make sure that we can relate these items when we implement it. Okay, so this is one of the ways where the tool can start to help you um, with the design task. All right, so now let's work through players. Okay, um, if we go through player here, notice it's already got the foreign key there. Right, and we'll just sort of add some things. We'll probably want something like a player ID. And we'll want to note that that's the uh, primary key. And then we'll want sort of like first name. And last name. And you know, there might be some other things that we'll want to put there. Okay, that's okay for now. Um, we would almost certainly want to make our foreign key required. Okay, we'll want to make sure that we do that. And you can see we're slowly working through, we're working out the details of each entity, what attributes we need to track, what the identifier should be, and even starting to think through how this will look in implementation with a key structure. Okay, so finally we're going to sort of handle um, the player position, right, because we still don't have an identifier or a primary key here. Um, we've talked a good deal about um, composite keys and surrogate keys, okay? This is a good place where we may want to use a composite key made up of both foreign keys, the position ID and the player ID. Um, this might be a convenient key structure for us because it, it does a few handy things. One, it makes, us, it makes it impossible for us to assign the same player to the same position, which 
if you think about it, almost by definition, that's something you wouldn't want to do, right? We want to restrict duplicates in that way. There's no way to do that now. Now that that uniquely identifies each record, you couldn't put the same player with the same position ID if you wanted to. Okay, so this is one place where the key structure actually helps protect your data and make it, uh, in a sense, makes it more difficult for someone to do something that's not logical according to the model. Okay, so selecting this key structure for this type of entity with these kinds of relationships is um, a pretty a pretty good decision in this case. You'll notice that because the foreign key has become part of the primary key, Visio is telling you that this is an identifying relationship, meaning that the primary key of player ID, when it functions as the foreign key in player position, becomes part of the identity of that entity, right? So in other words, our composite key is using foreign keys from other tables as part of its identity. Okay, so Visio tells you that, okay, and the notation tells you that with that solid line. Okay, so um, if we wanted to sort of replicate that here, right, I could come to this entity and notice if I make the team ID part of the primary key, the same thing will happen, right? Because now team ID is part of what identifies a player uniquely. Okay, that's actually not what we want there. Okay, we actually want it to look like that. Um, but I think you, you sort of get the point. Okay, so this is a good example of a place where it's appropriate to use a composite key. And um, some people are asking, you know, can foreign keys be part of a composite key? Or can you have foreign keys with other types of things? If it's a field, it can be part of the primary key and they can all work together to form a composite primary key if you think that's what you need. Um, and this is sort of a, a pretty good example of that. Um, we'll probably want to sort this out, right? We want to make sure that that uh, we can accommodate a long last name, right? Lots of people have last names that are longer than uh, 10 characters. And uh, I just want to point out a, a few other things. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover, but I wanted to make sure that people understood the different data types that are available to them and, and the data types that we'll sort of be focusing on. Um, Visio here, we'll talk about something called a Boolean or a yes, no value. Um, it, when, when you want to render some attribute that can either be in one of two states, yes or no, true or false, on or off, something like that, um, just use bit or binary okay, to represent that. I mean, I actually prefer bit, but really either, I guess, would be fine. Um, that'll translate roughly into a yes, no field in access. So um, just to give you a sense, I just want to walk you through some of the data types that you'll see and things you might want to use. Um, if we scroll down, obviously you'll want to use currency. Okay, that's something that, you know, we've clearly talked about. You'll want to use date time. Okay, that will be for dates. You'll want to use decimal. Okay, and um, decimal will give you the same uh, metadata options that you're used to. So, I mean, if I select uh, decimal here and I go to edit, you can actually go in and change the precision and scale. Okay, so um, in this way, it's very similar to what we've seen in Access. Um, and just to be thorough about this, uh, there's also integer. Remember, integer is what we would want to use for all of our surrogate keys. Okay, it's you know, but you know, that's you can you can feel comfortable that if it's a surrogate key, you want it to be an um, integer. And I think the only other thing that we'd really want to talk about is text, which we've already seen plenty of examples of. Uh, now, obviously, I just put this here for the purposes of uh, display. If I want to remove it. Okay, I remove it and it's gone. So um, I hope this was helpful. Uh, it just gives you a little bit of um, uh, sort of a wrap up of our discussion of last week. Uh, gives you some things to think about as you're going through your homework and your projects. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. See you later.